Hi, I'm Sarah and this is a video about the stages of labor. So labor refers to the delivery of a baby. This does not happen by means of a stork, but actually describes several stages of hard work endured by the mother until the baby is delivered. So this occurs between 37 and 42 weeks, when the fetus is full term. In some cases, labor may occur before 37 weeks, and this is referred to as preterm labor. It is divided into three stages. We've got stage one, where the cervix opens to full dilatation, allowing the head to pass through. We've got stage two, which is from full dilatation of the cervix to delivery of the fetus. And stage three, which involves delivery of the placenta. Great, so first let's have a look at how labor begins. Okay, so at the end of the third trimester, the cervix is being stretched by the baby due to release of certain factors. The stretching of the cervix sends signals to the brain, which in turn releases oxytocin. Oxytocin then stimulates uterine contractions. At the same time, the placenta releases prostaglandins, which also stimulate uterine contractions. These uterine contractions force the cervix to stretch even more, and therefore stimulating further contractions in a positive feedback loop. Initially, these contractions will be mild and irregular, and are referred to as Braxton-Hicks contractions, or false labor pains. These contractions may be accompanied by the show of labor. This refers to the mucus plug, which covers the cervical os. It protects the cervix and prevents bacteria from entering the uterus. It is supported by estrogen, so when this starts to decline at the end of the pregnancy, the mucus plug will fall and present as a pinkish discharge, referred to as the show of labor. The uterine contractions may also result in rupture of the amniotic membranes, and the mother will present with a sudden gush of fluid. These will both stimulate contractions further, until we get to the first stage of labor. So essentially the first stage of labor refers to the process by which the cervix becomes fully dilated, that is dilated up to 10 centimeters, as we can see in the pictures over here. Now the first stage of labor is divided into two. We have the latent phase and the active phase. During the latent phase, the cervix is slowly dilating up to 4 cm, and we have irregular uterine contractions. This phase can take up to several hours. Then we've got the active phase, where we have painful regular contractions now, which result in the cervix becoming fully dilated. Great, so over here we have another set of diagrams showing us the progression of the cervix. So we talk about effacement and dilatation. So essentially, effacement refers to the thickness of the cervix, while dilatation refers to how open the cervical loss is. So here we can see that the cervix is thick and closed, therefore not effaced and not dilated. Then the cervix first becomes fully effaced, as it is ripening and preparing for labor, and slowly starts dilating, and here it is 1 cm dilated. In the next diagram, it is up to 5 cm dilated, so since over here the dilatation is beyond 4 cm, we are in the active phase of the first stage. And then the cervix becomes fully dilated, ready to proceed to the second stage. Some important points I'd like to add here. So essentially, this process is slower in nulliparous women, with the active stage occurring around 1 cm per hour versus 2 cm per hour in multiparous women. In general, the duration of the active stage is usually less than 12 hours. During the first stage of labor, the membranes will rupture, unless they haven't already ruptured. Okay, good, so next we've got the second stage. And this refers to the period from full dilatation of the cervix till the baby is delivered. This is also divided into two stages, so we've got the passive stage and the active stage. During the passive stage, we are allowing for the scent of the fetal head until it reaches the pelvic floor and the woman experiences the desire to push. The active stage is when the mother is actively pushing. Now the second stage essentially is the process by which the baby must navigate through the maternal pelvis. And we have three factors which determine the progress, which we call the three Ps. 
We've got the powers, the passage, and the passenger. And we're going to look into each of these. So first up, the powers just refer to the strength of the uterine contractions. We should have around four to five strong contractions in 10 minutes. Next, we've got the passage, and this is mainly referring to the maternal pelvis. So let us take a look at the anatomy of the pelvis. So the pelvis essentially has three principal planes. We've got the inlet, mid cavity, and the outlet. So first, the inlet. This is where the passage of the fetal head down the pelvis starts off. It is bounded anteriorly by the symphysis pubis and crest, laterally by the pectineal lines, and posteriorly by the base of the sacrum and sacral promontory, as we can see here. The inlet has a transverse diameter of 13 cm, an oblique diameter of 12 cm, and an anteroposterior diameter of 11 cm. So what I'm going to do here is start jotting these diameters down, and you'll see why later on. So for the pelvic inlet, we said that the transverse diameter was 13 cm, oblique diameter 12 cm, and anteroposterior diameter 11 cm. So next, moving on to the mid cavity. So as we can see, the diameters have changed now, and we've got a transverse diameter of 12 cm, an oblique diameter of 13 cm, and an anteroposterior diameter of 12 cm and we're going to jot them down in the table again. Then we have the pelvic outlet, so bounded anteriorly by the pubic arch, laterally the ischial tuberosities and ischial spines, and posteriorly by the coccyx. Now the ischial spines are palpable vaginally, and we use them as landmarks to assess the station. But what is the station? So the station refers to the descent of the fetal head, and is measured according to the position relative to the ischial spines. So basically station zero is when the head is at the level of the spines. Station plus two is when the head is two centimeters below, and minus two is when the head is two centimeters above, as we can see over here. Great, so back to our pelvic outlet, we've got a transverse diameter of 11 centimeters, an oblique diameter of 12 centimeters, and an anteroposterior diameter of 13 centimeters. Good, so here they are again written in our table. Now, obviously, to make delivery easier, we want the fetal head to pass through the largest space available in the pelvis. And as we can see over here, the largest diameters are the transverse diameter of the pelvic inlet, the oblique diameter of the mid cavity, and the anteroposterior diameter of the pelvic outlet. So we shall be seeing how the head shall be rotating accordingly to fit these largest diameters, so keep this in mind. We're going to refer back to this. Great, so next we're going to move on to the passenger. So here, of course, we're talking about the characteristics regarding the baby. And essentially, we have three which we need to consider. And these are the size of the head, the fetal attitude, and the position. So let's start off with the head. So here we need to go back to the anatomy again. So here we have the fetal skull. So, starting off with the bones, we have the two frontal bones, the two parietal bones, and the occipital bone. Now, as you can see, the bones are not fused yet, but there are spaces in between, and these are called the sutures and the fontanelles. So, between the frontal bones, we have the frontal suture. Between the frontal bones and the parietal bones, we have the coronal suture. Between the two parietal bones, we have the sagittal suture. And between the parietal and occipital bones, we have the lambdoid suture. Now, the space over here is referred to as the anterior fontanelle, or the bregma. And here we've got the posterior fontanelle, also referred to as the occiput. Good, so essentially because of these spaces between the bones, the head can be compressed as the bones come closer together, and sometimes also overlap. And this is referred to as molding, as you can see in these diagrams. Increased pressure can also result in localized swelling, which is referred to as caput. Good, so next we're going to talk about the fetal attitude. Now this is referring to the degree of flexion of the head on the neck. So ideally the head is completely flexed, as we can see in this picture. 
Why? Because it gives us the smallest possible presenting diameter of the fetal skull, which is 9.5 cm. This is also called the vertex presentation. If the head is not flexed, which we call deflexed, we've got a larger diameter of 11.5 cm. If the head is extended with a brow presentation, we have a 13 cm diameter. Then if the head is hyperextended, we get a face presentation with a diameter of 9.5 cm. So one might ask, face presentation is also a good fetal attitude because it also has a 9.5 cm diameter. The problem is that as we're going to see soon, when the head is being delivered, one of the maneuvers used to exit out of the pelvis is extension. And in this case, since the head is fully extended, there is no further extension which can take place to aid delivery, hence creating problems. Okay, so lastly we've got position. So here we're referring to the rotation of the head on the neck and essentially what positions the head is taking while maneuvering through the pelvis. So essentially we want the smallest diameter of the head to pass through the largest diameter of the pelvis. So let's look at the table again showing the dimensions of the pelvis. So the pelvic inlet was largest in its transverse diameter. Therefore, as we can see here, the head is entering the pelvis in a transverse position, which we call occipital transverse position. In the mid cavity, which is largest in its oblique diameter, we have the head rotating. Then in the pelvic outlet, having its largest diameter in the anteroposterior plane, the head has rotated 90 degrees in an occipital anterior position to exit the pelvic outlet. Great, so now that we have understood the three P's, we can move on to delivery of the head. So essentially, first we have flexion of the head, giving us that small 9.5 cm diameter with the vertex presentation. The head descends into the mid cavity. As we said, then it starts rotating so that once the head has reached the pelvic outlet, it has turned by 90 degrees and now lies in an occipital anterior position. Then the head is delivered through extension of the head on the neck. Once the head is out, it returns and rotates by 90 degrees back to its original position. And this is called restitution. This is done to help delivery of the shoulders, so they, do, they too can enter the inlet of the pelvis through its largest diameter. So another set of pictures over here. So first we have delivery of the anterior shoulder, then the posterior shoulder, until the entire body and umbilical cord is delivered. And that is the end of the second stage. So now we have the third stage, which refers to the delivery of the placenta. It usually lasts about 15 minutes, and normal blood loss is up to 500 mils. And that is the end of labor. I hope that this video was helpful. Thank you.